Welcome to another episode of Judgment Date. And as you know, these are programs that we've been doing during the lockdown in order to help people through this difficult time and perhaps to discuss issues which are troubling them during this particular time. And it's a great pleasure today to welcome Mark Gavissa, who, um, when we were discussing this earlier, said I could describe him as an author and a journalist. That's perhaps a bit unfair. Mark's one of our most distinguished authors and journalists, has written an extraordinary amount on a range of topics. And perhaps I wanted to start, Mark, by kind of going back to the magisterial text that you wrote on Becky, and just sort of thinking about how, in a way, the, this president seems to have dealt so differently with this virus as compared to Mbeki with regard to the, H, the HIV one. Dennis, uh, thank you for having me on this. It's, it's a great initiative. Um, it, the, the obvious comparison, first comparison to make uh, would be the way uh, President Ramaphosa has, has listened to science and scientists uh, when it comes to the coronavirus in, op in opposition to the way Thabo Mbeki um, refused to listen to science and scientists and medicine until he was taken to the Constitutional Court and forced to uh, when it came to HIV AIDS. And that to me um, is interesting in and of itself, but it, but it puts its finger on something else which I have tried to explore in a piece that I just wrote for The Guardian, which is what do different generations of South African leaders feel about being in control and what control means? And, and what's been um, super impressive to me about Ramaphosa to date is, is the way he has used um, the coronavirus to accelerate what I call his ideology of social compacting. This idea he has that goes back to his days as a trade unionist and as a chief negotiator, that the way we find solutions and exercise power in this country is by working together. Um, government, business, labor, civil society, not as much as it should be, frankly, uh, when, it, when it comes to, to the way I think Ramaphosa's social compacting um, around the coronavirus. And it's been very interesting to see him model that. But it's also been interesting for me to see other politicians in his cabinet some of whom were very close to Tabo Mbeki, like in course Zana Glamini Zuma, exercised power in a way that I think is sort of old school and more Mbekiist and more vanguardist in, 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 in the original meaning of that word, which is, is that um, I am a prophet unto the nations, I have seen the light before you have, and I need to lead you, my people into the promised land. And that comes for, for, for mission school educated people like Tabo Mbeki and Kosisana Dlamini Zuma from the church as well as from the party. In fact, with Dlamini Zuma, it probably doesn't come from the Communist Party directly because I don't see any evidence that she was ever a Communist Party member. But that was certainly the, um, the tradition of the ANC in exile that I think she imbibed. And it's very interesting for me to see these two approaches to leadership that I think are lodged in generationally uh, in, in the way we're seeing different, the, the, the tone and approach of different leaders. So let me just try to, to, to push that slightly. Um, when Becky was the president, um, it didn't appear to me that anybody said anything against him. In other words, they all marched to the Becky drum. I mean, we didn't, we didn't, if I recall, have many cabinet ministers or any for that matter, when he was at his pump, actually saying, this is outrageous. And in fact, you aren't, you, you, you promulgating pseudoscience and this is causing enormous death and damage and injury to our country. 
strange as it may seem, when I read your piece, which I commend to everybody that you wrote in The Guardian yesterday, it seemed to me that exactly as you've developed it now, there's a disconnect. But the president, in a sense, comes across in a particular way. And yet, as it were, his ministers are, as it were, articulating a, a very different voice. What well, it's interesting. Say? I mean, is that, uh, firstly, I don't want to read too much into it because I do have to acknowledge that we're all reading the tea leaves here. And I don't have, an, I don't have a direct line to what's happening in cabinet. And there are people who, who I know and trust who tell me that actually Ramaphosa and Lamini Zuma are very close, despite the fact that they were at war with each other for the leadership of the party. And in fact, Feriel Hafiji in a piece in the Daily Maverick has written this much. So I, I don't know what the nature of their relationship is. Um, what is clear from, from the way um, uh, the smoking ban has been, uh, was going to be released and then, that, and then Ramaphosa was countermanded, it seems, in public by Blamini Zuma and then had to come in and say, actually, I agree with, it's a collective decision, this tobacco ban. By that, and also by Tito Mboweni, who, let's face it, is a loose cannon, um, going public, not once, but twice, to say that he strongly voted against um, the alcohol and tobacco ban because of the loss of revenue and sin tax. Um, for better or for worse, Ramaphosa does not run as tight a ship as Tabo Mbeki did. I don't think people fear him the way they feared Mbeki. And I don't think he wants to be feared the way Mbeki wanted or needed to be feared. Now, we, could, we can have a debate about whether that's good or bad for, for a unified message because there's been a lot of critique uh, from people, including myself, that one of the problems with what's happened in the last week has been an inconsistency in message. I don't know. What do you think? No, that's exactly what I uh, what I what I wanted to, to debate with you. It's, it seems to me you're right. There is an inconsistency of message. I am the start study whether um, uh, Doctor Nkosazan Lamini Zuma and Mr Ramaphosa are well. They can't be drinking trums now because there's a ban on alcohol. But, uh -huh. um, but but what I mean by that is that they may drink tea together. I have I know I, you know I don't know. I've also heard what you've heard. What I what I'm much more intrigued about is the message. Because it did seem to me that this is a time when one needs a coherent message. Uh, and I think the effect of that is what you've just highlighted, is that there's now a lot of, uh, I suppose, concern and, and perhaps anger at, at, at messaging, which on the one hand says, well, it's less about the cigarettes, because many of us don't smoke, don't want to smoke and think smoking's terrible. But it's the question about president says, well, you can go and buy cigarettes, and then a few days later, you can't buy cigarettes. Well, I mean, was, what science did he get when he was giving his first announcement as to the second one, and what is going on here? It's, it's less about, you know, how comradely they are, and more about the perception of, is the government talking with one voice at a time when it has to? Listen, yeah, I mean, and we're, we're always, it, it's the nature of our... <laughs> of our critical fractious civil society, which is, you know, one of the great gifts um, that we have. Not a gift, it's a right. But that we're, we're going to, we're going to criticize Mbeki for running too tight a ship and Ramaphosa for running a ship that's okay. not okay. tight enough. Um, sure. uh, but what, what, what has been said about Ramaphosa is that he, he is, because of the, the factionalism in the ANC, and because of the narrow way he came to, to power, that he does not have full control over his party and his cabinet. Now, once more, I don't know whether that's true or not in this time of, of the pandemic, but one gets that impression in a way that is unfortunate when, not, um, yeah. when, one, when one sees that sort of disconnect in messaging. And also, uh, for me, uh, as significant as the, dis as, the, as, the, as the disconnect in, in messaging is, is the difference in tone. And, um, and look, again, I'm going to put in a caveat here. I, I'm not an older rural Zulu woman. 
So I don't know how Nkwa Susana Dwanuzuna comes across when she speaks Isi Zulu to that particular constituency. And frankly, to my shame, I don't even know what she's saying when she's speaking Isi Zulu. But I do know that when she's speaking to me, she's talking to me as if I'm a naughty child. Whereas when Ramaphosa is talking to me, he's talking to me with empathy, with sorrow, and with compassion. And, and I know just from the little bit of reporting I'm able to do in the lockdown, that I'm not the only one who feels that way. Um, so I um, am doing a fair bit of reporting uh, in a community called Masipumelele, which yes. is a very dense settlement close to where I live in the South Peninsula, 40,000 people in one square kilometer, social distancing, impossible, impossible. And, and very, very high numbers of people who don't have regular employment and therefore, you know, serious concerns about hunger and, and, and loss, of, loss of income. And what's been really striking to me was is that, that, that the day after Ramaphosa gave his, his first significant address about the lockdown, or very soon after that, a couple of weeks ago, it seems like another era, um, I was doing some volunteer work in Mercy. Um, helping to deliver chronic medicine. And I was able to talk to people as I was doing this work a little bit. And one message came through very strongly. And that is, is that the president understands that this is difficult for us. We, 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 trust, we trust that this is the right thing to happen because the president seems to understand how much we are suffering. And and even though the president allegedly talks more to people like you and me um, because he speaks English only and because he's sort of corporate, it was fascinating for me to hear how that message had got through from the president to the people I was engaging with on the ground. It was fascinating. Almost, um, the, way, almost the way in which and, and, it, was said, it was said about, um, about FDR. Um, the famous story when he died, uh, the man next to a journalist was hysterically crying and the journalist said to him, did you know FDR? And he said, no, but he knew me. That's wonderful. It's that uh, kind of thing. That, that's what you're talking about, isn't it? Uh, I mean, yeah, it, it's the yeah, sense in which yeah. Ramaphosa has managed to convey, I know your pain and I can feel it. But, but that's, a, that's let, a terrific let, gift. Let's come in with a critical thing. Let's come in with a, with a, with a critical edge here, which is, yes. is that he's not doing an Andrew Cuomo on us, or thank God, Donald Trump on us. We're not <laughs> seeing him every night. Yes. Uh, we, we see him very occasionally in a kind of somber statesman-like address to the nation, and the detail is left to his cabinet. You know, one of the critiques of Ramaphosa since he's come to power is, is that he's not present enough. And I would share that critique in this moment. I think that if he embodies a sort of form of state compassion for the difficulty that we're going through, let's see that a little bit more. Um, and it's fair enough that we can't see that from NDZ or Zwellian Kize or Ibrahim Patel because they are so damn busy with all the regulations and all the rules. It's in a way maybe not time for them to, to, be, um, to be able to transmit that. I don't know, that's it, debatable. It, I, I, but maybe I, I, that is a presidential it, role and it's something we're missing. It's something well, we're I, missing. I, I, I take the point, but that's the, then that leads to the second uh, theme of your article, um, which is that, in a way, that goodwill that Ramaphosa engenders in all of us when he speaks, and that sense of pride, I think, that the nation, and it's interesting that people in Massey think in exactly the same way as probably pe people in Bishop's Court on this one, if I, if I could take two extremes of the class divide and South African race divide, um, that they feel, both groups feel that way. Um, the problem is that that when you get the kind of bans and the hard sort of securocratic type responses, lockdowns and what have you, 
there is a sense of disquiet that the country uh, may yeah, be moving uh, moving away from its I constitutional mean, me, guardrails, if I could put it that way. Let me tell you another story from Masi, which is, is that um, there have been two police interventions in the settlement that I know of. The first was a really vicious and arbitrary raid, allegedly on illegal bear brewers and shabines um, near the beginning of the lockdown. And the attitude towards the police after that was, these guys are the enemy. They really are the enemy. Why should we listen to them? Then, a short while later, um, uh, the community health workers came in to do screening tests in Mercy, accompanied by um, police and army, soldiers and police officers, law enforcement from the city, um, SAPS and army, so all, all sort of three tiers. And apparently, I'm told, I wasn't there, but I'm told by people who were there, were there and watched it, that um, the police were exemplary and unbelievably helpful and caring and helpful and, and projecting, projecting an, an, a, 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 a message of we're here to help you. And, and I'm told once more, I, I don't live in Masi and I haven't been able to go there often, but I'm told that there was something of a shift in attitude after that second intervention. And I think there's such an important lesson there. And, and, and I did write in my piece about, in my, in my piece in The Guardian about the way um, the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights has called South Africa out for its use of undue violence during the lockdown. And we know um, that there have been 180,000 arrests already and uh, that there have been several violations, including at least two murders. We know all of that to be true. I worry we're not capturing the other part of that enough. And then, in fact, if I could indulge in some self-critique, that I, don't, I haven't captured that enough in what I've been writing, which is, which is um, people who come from communities themselves and who wear a uniform doing the job well. Now, I guess I, I can't say, because I'm not a reporter on the ground, how much of that is, how much of there is of the one and how much of there is of the other. But I'm certain I know what we need. And that is, and that is the, um, the we're here to help you approach. Now, let me say that with a caveat, because one of the things I write in, in my piece in The Guardian is, is that to be fair to Minister Becky Kerle, who, who I have found, frankly, quite loathsome in every time he opens his mouth, because of the, the pleasure he seems to be getting from, from strutting about with his new power and from how, the pleasure he seems to be getting in telling us what he's going to do to us if we break the law. Mm. But I have to admit in his, in his favor that, you know, we're not Sweden. We are not the most law-abiding nation on earth. And we can look at the roots of that. The roots of that are in apartheid. And the roots of that are also, of course, in the fact that we mistrust our government because certainly in the last 10 years, our government has been very corrupt. And we've all dealt, or well, I know I have, and I'm sure many of the people listening to this have, have dealt with corrupt policemen. So why should we listen to them? We've got this terrible problem in our country. But and now it's a that problem we've got that, this, carry on, carry yeah. on. Oh no, what I was gonna say, I keep on thinking of Johnny Steinberg who wrote this really wonderful little book that's often sort of missed over in his earth called Thin Blue, mm. about the difficulties of policing in South Africa. And one of the things he says that, that sticks with me always is policing requires people consenting to be policed. And we don't necessarily have that in this country. So it's very difficult. No, I think it is very difficult, and I think COVID-19 has brought us unprecedented challenges the world over, and no government is going to come out of this with a 100% record. Maybe the New Zealand Prime Minister, I don't know. But the truth is that, that, that most of us, most governments are battling. But the question that comes out of your article is that as you get 
a sort of hard line sort of response to some of these issues for whatever reason. And as people become more disillusioned for whatever reason, the danger is that the kind of constitutional fabric starts to unravel. And that going forward, and that, and I wanted to ask you about that. Do you think we're in danger here of actually, in a sense, losing the constitutional plot uh, as we go along? Or is this, will we recover that if we just get out of this thing relatively quickly? Well, I mean, I suppose, I mean, I should be asking you this, and I will ask you this. I'd love to hear what you have to say. <laughs> okay. um, um, I, I mean, recover, are we going to recover suggests that we have already lost some of the constitutional plot. And, and I'm not, I don't personally feel quite ready to say that yet. I see the alarm bells. Um, uh, I see um, the a danger of, of a breakdown in trust, which, you know, as I've said before, wasn't really there to begin with. Uh, when, when we are treated like naughty subjects rather than than um, struggling citizens. Um, and I think that we need trust more than anything if we're going to work together to fight this pandemic. But, but, but here's, do here's I, what I get, Yeah. Here's what, go, I sh- what I want to sharpen the question is constitutional democracy relies, as you've been saying time and again during this interview, correctly so, it does rely, in a sense, on a symbiotic relationship of trust. We have to trust the authorities, but they have to trust us. And when they start saying things like, you can't do this and you can't do that, and we're going to lock you down, and if you misbehave, then, in fact, we'll go back to level five, etc. That seems to me not the kind of, as it were, philosophical position that is congruent with a constitutional democracy. That's much more congruent with sort of Donald Trump type authoritarian tendencies. And that's why I mean, you know, um, not that we lost, but that there's a danger there uh, that Mm. people have not, Mm. that whatever, for whatever reason, certain people, given the difficulties, when the pressures are are, are there, seem to go back to a default position of authority rather than a default position of consent. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a, that seems to me to be a legitimate, a, a legitimate concern and one that I share. Yes. So, where, um, where, so where, when you wrote your article, in a sense, what I was intrigued by, because as I went through it, it, it was an article of warning, and yet somehow you seem to be more relaxed about that than perhaps I as the reader was, having finished ha! reading your article. But ha! maybe I read it wrongly. No. No, um, no. I think you've just got the um, the lawyer's ability and the constitutional expert's ability to take what I expressed um, emotionally and politically about the importance of trust and to frame it as a constitutional issue. But maybe, um, Mark, thank you, thank you for the compliment. But here's the thing. It's ordinary people, the people that you're reporting on, the people at Nasi, the other people that journalists are reporting on. There's a, there's a, there is, to be quite blunt, it seems to me, if, I mean, I haven't got out, so I don't know enough, but I mean, it does appear to me just reading all over the place that there is a serious frustration, if not anger, brewing in people who, in a sense, well, say... Me, yeah, Australia, I mean, I'm not, not... Yeah, carry on. I'm not... I, I don't have enough information to, 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 to um, warn of a, of a powder keg that's going to explode. And, and I'm, very, I'm very, very careful. I mean, particularly South Africans abroad. Um, that, that idea of, you know, yet again, this trope of South Africa, the powder keg, is kind of going wild in, a certain, in certain social media channels. And um, I, I'm, very, I'm very wary of that. But... No, so am I. And I mean, the, yeah. yeah, and the fact that their that their governments, these expatriate governments, whether it be in the US and UK, have done much, much worse than we've done, inconceivably yeah. worse. They don't seem to understand yeah. that. Yeah, but, but let me, but let let me, me ask you a story. Yeah. Yes, please do. Coming okay, to so end, it's, carry it's on. an anecdote, and it's it's an anecdote about um, uh, a, a group of people in Massey again, who are working on a project that involves Anne Frank. 
right? Wow. And it's been quite difficult for, for particularly the kids involved in this project to, to understand the condition of Anne Frank. And a lot of that has to do with a lack of education about the Holocaust, which is another story. But what was very interesting is, is after the lockdown, somebody involved in this project made the observation that the lockdown is really going to help these kids understand Anne Frank because the government is locking us down here um, the way Anne Frank was locked down in Amsterdam by the Nazis. And I found that absolutely chilling as, as, as an augury, that, that, that it was a perception of uh, a government, the state, the authorities, the big man, the boss, taking away your freedom in a way comparable, metaphorically, to the way Anne, Fried Anne Frank's freedom was taken away. Now, of course, it's nothing of the sort. I mean, the state is doing this to protect us, not to take away our freedom. But that there might be that perception. And again, I don't want to expand an anecdote that's actually secondhand into sort of lofty political analysis. So there's my caveat again. But, but hearing that really chilled me and made me worried about what happens if this is implemented in the wrong way. Well, I think that's, a, that's exactly, in a sense, what I took from your article. And it, it worries me uh, that, 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 in a way, we've done many good things, but, but that if we don't take care, we could well shoot ourselves in the foot, and notwithstanding the good things that we've done and the fact that we have been so much better than many other countries. But I've, I've run out of time. Mark, I just want to thank you very much um, for, as always with you, when one has a conversation, it's invigorating, it's interesting, it's provocative, and it makes one think. It's made me think. I'm sure it's made everybody else think. Thank you so much. It's great to be on this, Dennis. Thanks great. for the initiative. Pleasure.